again uh, i want to welcome everybody those uh, on the social media on the zoom platform those watching us on scbc tv back on ground zero and wherever you are in sub-saharan africa and those watching us on social media uh, mr uh, philip miller is the author of uh, the uk backed article uh, the uk backing uh, the regime run by five men it made the rounds in southern cameroon circles it raised a lot of questions uh, and issues and discussions and the southern cameroon's international town hall uh, reached out uh, to mr phil miller so that we could have a discussion with him uh, you know delving deeper into the article and maybe some things he couldn't uh, publish because of space and what have you also mr miller may also have uh, questions to further um, inform himself about the situation in southern cameroons uh, mr miller is an investigative journalist and chief reporter of declassified uk he is the author of kini mini the british mercenaries who got away with war crimes he has written extensively um, on ongoings in several parts of africa including kenya and other um, countries um, <clears throat> across the continent so without further ado mr philip miller you are welcome to the southern cameroon's international town hall thank you Atu, and, and thank you for having me here today um, on this platform i'm very honored to be here um, so i'll just start by explaining a little bit about declassified uk the the media outlet uh, and the website that i work for so we try to uh, uncover britain's real role in the world and by that i mean you often hear the british government talking about how it promotes democracy and human rights around the world um, when in fact often what the evidence shows and the declassified british government files show is that they uh, often prioritize promoting arms deals and um, uh, energy deals ahead of democracy and, and human rights. So a lot of our work focuses in, in the Gulf countries like Saudi Arabia, where that um, contradiction is perhaps the starkest. But we also look at um, many of the countries in, in Africa where um, there are either undemocratic regimes um, like in, in Cameroon, and Uganda, or there are um, security forces that, although their leaders are democratically elected, like in Kenya or Nigeria, we see a lot of um, human rights abuses associated with them. Um, and often we find, particularly in the former um, British colonies, that the UK has maintained a role there almost continuously since independence in terms of police training, uh, inviting soldiers to Sandhurst, to the military academy in the UK, and, and selling weapons. Um, but um, Cameroon was one country that um, we hadn't looked at much as an organisation before. Um, and because many people think it's as a former French colony, uh, you know, people think that France has, has more of an influence there. So um, I think it was around April last year, we saw on Twitter that the UK... Ministry of Defence had uh, put out a photograph of one of their armed forces ministers um, in, in Cameroon and it just said something about he'd been there to see the UK's work with the BIR, with the um, Rapid Intervention Battalion. And this was quite surprising because there, there weren't any other references really to this kind of work going on um, and certainly not to have a minister going out there. So we then tried to get hold of um, that minister's briefing notes for his visit, um, which, which took a long time to get hold of. And I can't go into exactly how we got hold of them because I don't want to get someone in, in trouble. But um, we were basically able to see a lot more information than, than we would have expected about his, his visit to Cameroon and what he was being told the UK military was doing there and what they hope to achieve through that visit. Um, and so what the documents show is there are these six um, operations um, with Cameroon security forces, and most of them are framed as dealing with the Boko Haram and Islamic State insurgency 
in the far north. Um, but obviously, once you start training Cameroon security forces, there's no real way to guarantee that the people you train don't then get sent to southern Cameroons um, to repress your community there. Um, and so what, what I found from the documents was that um, even where, so the British are very aware of this risk, and one way that they think of trying to reduce the risk, um, which I personally don't think makes any sense, but their logic is um, they try and train BIR units um, as close to the front line as they can and as near to them being deployed to the front line so that they can have more confidence that the soldiers they train are going to go and fight Boko Haram rather than people in Ambazonia and southern Cameroons. Um, now, obviously, there's nothing to stop those units once they've been involved in fighting Boko Haram then being sent to uh, southern Cameroons. So I don't really think that the, the logic works there. Uh, but another thing I found that they were doing is that they're building a training village in Salak, which is a, a barracks in the far north for the Rapid Intervention Battalion. Now, so they're building training infrastructure for them there, and they are supplying um, like uh, blank ammunition and, and simulated weaponry that they can use. Now, clearly, um, you know, even if the British uh, soldiers then withdraw, that training village has been built, the infrastructure is there for Paul Bia to decide how uh, that he wants to train his soldiers there and then send them anywhere in the country, including southern Cameroons. So although they're very aware of this risk of, you know, the people they train to fight Boko Haram being diverted to fight against people in your community, uh, and they say they try and put in place efforts to, to reduce that risk. Um, they are doing things like building permanent training infrastructure, which obviously can then be used however uh, the Cameroon authorities decide. And something I don't think I mentioned in the article, but it's not just uh, a training village in Salak that they appear to be, that they are building. There's also an indication from the documents that they're doing a similar project near the capital of Cameroon, building some kind of security training facility there as well. So obviously that's even closer to southern Cameroon. Um, another very surprising thing from the document was that there is a UK Special Forces officer, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Purser, who has been out in Cameroon for a number of years. And he is on very good terms with um, senior figures in, in the regime, such as the head of intelligence. Um, and also that he drafted a, a crisis management doctrine for Paul Bia, for the president of Cameroon. Now, obviously, the situation in southern Cameroons the last few years has been regarded as a, as a, as a crisis. You know, they refer to, to it as an ang anglophone crisis and so on. So the fact that a UK special forces officer has drafted a crisis management doctrine uh, for, you know, this authoritarian president of Cameroon. Um, I don't really see how the UK can argue that that is just to deal with Boko Haram and, and the insurgency in the far north. Um, I mean, we haven't uh, been able to see that, that crisis management doctrine, but uh, the way it's talked about in the documents that we have seen, it would seem to imply that this is, a, is quite a, a broad ranging document to cover crises in general. So I think, although uh, when I went to the UK military for comment before publishing, they said, you know, we are trying to tackle Boko Haram. Um, it seems quite clear that many of the things that they are doing in Cameroon could be diverted towards suppressing um, movements in southern Cameroon, um, which given Britain's colonial role um, there as well, it, it feels like there's a sense of betrayal um, going on as well. So I think that that um, that made it quite a, a significant set of documents that we saw. Um, uh, one other thing that um, came out of the documents 
is they also cover um, the UK's role in, in Nigeria, which I haven't um, published yet, but the Nigerian authorities were um, not that keen on, on the UK military giving them too much support to tackle Boko Haram. And so one way that the UK thought they could get more uh, involved in, in fighting against that group was to go through Cameroon, uh, because obviously in the far north, the border with Nigeria, there's quite a bit of crossover with, with Boko Haram. So they felt this was almost like a backdoor into Nigeria. Um, that being said, you know, what the UK has been doing in Nigeria, um, something else that we found uh, in a previous investigation was that Nigerian Air Force pilots were in the UK learning to fly helicopters and the Nigerian Air Force have used um, helicopter gunships to attack civilian targets in Nigeria. So um, there's also issues with what the UK are doing in Nigeria. Um, but much of what we found in the documents hasn't been um, made public before. And uh, the UK is very aware that the Paul Beers regime is very corrupt. They have this phrase in, in the documents about it being run by five men. Um, and they seem to overlook this because Paul Beer is, is seen as pro-Western and he voted uh, with the UK at the uh, chemical weapons organization against actions of Russia and Syria. Um, so they seem to um, be happy to tolerate his abuses simply because he is, he is pro-Western. Obviously, you know, France and the US have quite a significant role in Cameroon as well, which has already been reported. Um, but uh, I think this sheds probably the most light so far on what the UK's role um, has been. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's other um, points to make. No, I think, I mean, that might be enough to start with. And then if people have questions, uh, oh, there was one other issue about the um, the aircraft, the military transport aircraft for Cameroon. So clearly, if they're trying to airlift troops to different parts of the country, uh, be that the far north or southern Cameroon, then uh, these C-130 military aircraft are quite important. Um, and there's a British firm called Marshall Aerospace, which the documents say are doing the maintenance for those aircraft but they hadn't been paid, uh, so they weren't able to do the maintenance. And part of uh, the briefing for the British minister when he went to Cameroon was to try and get, the, get them paid so that they could go ahead with the maintenance. And obviously that raises concerns about whether those troops, are, those aircraft are going to fly troops into uh, southern Cameroon. Um, and then an, another British company called Torchlight Group was giving um, intelligence training so, um, yeah, it's important to say that the UK hasn't just been working with the Rapid Intervention Battalion, it's also been working with the DGRE Intelligence Agency as well, um, who the Amnesty International reports accuse of um, being involved in, in torture and other human rights abuses. So, um, yeah, I think that's, that's probably enough to get started with. Um, I have uh, <clears throat> thank you very thank you very much uh, Phil for that wonderful uh, summary of uh, the work the wonderful work uh, you're doing uh, <clears throat> I just wanted to let you know if you could up your mic I think your voice was uh, very low at some points thank you uh, but again thank you for taking the time uh, to come and uh, uh, talk to us and take questions it's uh, very important because we being a former uh, British colony, uh, we have counted a lot on uh, the British government. Uh, to some point, they have acknowledged some mistakes, but we felt as a member of the Commonwealth being an Anglo-Saxon country, uh, we expected more. So it's important that uh, we know both what's happening uh, on the front scenes and what's happening uh, behind the scenes. Uh, you have been very categorical and very factual in your article. You gave specific names, you gave specific locations, you gave specific uh, visits and missions. Um, there's a lot of uh, specific details 
which we could now you know take and ask you know what's going on here so thank you again and uh, i would open the floor maybe if people have uh, questions or things of interest like you say which could uh, uh, provoke further discussions on this issue uh, i will ask the secretary first if they have any questions uh, for mr miller and then maybe we could uh, take a few uh, Mr. Miller has very limited time with us, uh, an hour, so we may not be able to exhaust everything. We have about 43 minutes, and we will try to squeeze in as much as we can. Uh, uh, Secretariat. Uh, yeah, after from the Secretariat, uh, one of the things that we would like uh, Mr. Miller to touch on from his article was the view, uh, the perception of uh, uh, one of the protagonists, I think, was that we felt about how the view Ambazonia. I mean, uh, Southern Cameroons. Maybe he can uh, think that's the last piece of the article that um, he hasn't touched yet um, on yet, because it gives us an indication as to why to start thinking about the relationship that, uh, um, as we view our relationship with Britain currently. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm happy to to yeah respond to that uh, straight away. So. Um, there, there is a section in the documents that talks more about the kind of diplomatic uh, analysis of, of the conflict and in there they do acknowledge uh, so the british diplomats are are well aware of of what they call widespread human rights abuses um in in ambazonia they say that they occur both at the hands of the state security forces and of, of what they call the separatists um that that's their view uh, but, you know, it's important that they acknowledge that the Cameroon state is is perpetrating human rights abuses. Um, their analysis is that the um, the kind of the political demands, you know, uh, often uh, the foreign office, they love to divide groups into moderate and extreme. So this is their framework. It's not my um, understanding of the, of the conflict. But the, the British diplomats think that the, the demand for independence outright, they don't think that has popular support, but they, they see demands for greater autonomy, um, some kind of financial compensation, and uh, the use of English and protection of civilians. By that, I understand you know, that the Cameroon state security forces either vastly improving their conduct or, or withdrawing and allowing some kind of local... Um, policing systems um so they, they think that those moderate demands are are much more um things that they would be willing to support and that they think unless those demands are addressed then then the, the conflict will continue to simmer they say so they anticipate it that it will carry on but they also note that um one of the senior figures in in the regime think that um the situation can only be resolved through through military force which is um obviously quite concerning given um what's happened so far um but they also um try and uh, use their experience from northern ireland which is is quite common we've seen this in a lot of um countries the british try and uh set themselves up as kind of peace building experts based on what happened in, in northern ireland um and jeffrey donaldson who he's publicly listed as the uk trade envoy to cameroon he is a, a right-wing uh mp in northern ireland um who's a very pro-british um he apparently um helped develop some kind of dialogue plan for the crisis but it doesn't tell us much detail about what that what was involved in that plan um but one thing that they say um, Cameroon shouldn't do um, is uh, effectively an internment, which the British Army did um, in, in the early 1970s in Northern Ireland um, when they uh, arrested lots of IRA suspects and held them without charge. Um, so they, they have at least advised Cameroon not to try and go down that route. Um, but um, yeah, beyond that, we don't know uh, exactly what Jeffrey Donaldson, uh, what his advice was. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps to answer at least some of your question there, Edmund. 
Yes. Um, Thank you very much. Yep. <clears throat> Yes, mm -hmm. if I can follow up with a follow-up question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Miller. <clears throat> and this is from uh, uh, yeah, Dr. Kilo. <clears throat> nothing you have said, <clears throat> excuse me, nothing you have said points to a direct involvement of the UK in the war in southern Cameroons, is it? Cameroon is a part of the Commonwealth and Britain is dealing with Cameroon as a member of that organization, although Anglophones do not benefit from that relationship. So I think the crux of the question is if any evidence points to a direct involvement in the war in Southern Cameroon. Well, I think they, you know, they've clearly been directly involved in, in trying to draw up this, this dialogue plan uh, through, through Jeffrey D Donaldson, who's, who's now the UK's trade envoy there. Um, but on the military side, um, I mean, the thing is, the way that they're giving this support to the Rapid Intervention Battalion and the DGRE intelligence service, um, you know, they might be training them uh, with a with a focus on how to tackle Boko Haram, but there's nothing to stop the units they've trained uh, making use of those better uh, enhanced tactics uh, or intelligence gathering strategies to then apply those same techniques to to southern Cameroon. Um, and, and they are aware of that risk themselves. Um, and like I said, the, the kind of tactic that they use to try and reduce that risk by training troops as close to the front line in the far north as possible uh, i think that's only a very short-term solution because you know okay they might go out the next day to fight Boko haram but what's to stop them in a month or so being re-diverted to the south on these military transport planes that a british british company is uh, meant to be paid to maintain uh, and then being deployed to southern cameroon having had um you know advanced training from um, this British Army unit uh, who is um, being run by a, a UK Special Forces officer. So I think that, you know, it's impossible to completely firewall uh, support that the UK gives to Cameroon's military to fight in the far north from what they might then go and do in uh, southern Cameroon. Uh, Secretary, I mistakenly accidentally lowered mr harrison's hand uh i think i don't know if you had a question mr harrison uh, unmute yourself mr harrison can you unmute uh while we're why, waiting why he were, we're yes, waiting i am okay yeah okay. i am all right go ahead Thank you so much for your insight of what you could find. And we really appreciate your courage for taking that position to publish this kind of document. The question I have for you at this time is, if you look at the Berlin Convention on the definition of genocide, at this particular moment, based on what has been happening on uh, Ground Zero and Bazonia, we clearly fit into that uh, definition of genocide. What uh, stops you from calling it a genocide uh, as opposed to a crisis as the most of the world define it today? Yeah, so that, that's a very good question. Um, I think because, because with this investigation, we have drawn almost entirely on the British uh, government documents. So a lot of the quotes in the article are quoting the way British diplomats describe what is happening in Cameroon. So they, they refer to it as a crisis rather than a genocide. Um, but I'm, that doesn't mean I don't think it's a genocide. Um, it's just, this is probably the first time that I've written about Cameroon. So, um, you know, because I write about UK policy towards lots of different countries, I'm not an expert on the situation in Cameroon. So I'll definitely take on board what you've said today and read up more on those reports. And then maybe when I return to this issue, I'll be more confident at using that language myself. Uh, but I'd certainly be in a better position now to get uh, quotes from uh, people in your group uh, next time we cover Cameroon uh, so that that kind of language can be certainly included in, in some way in the article. Thank you. 
One more question from the Secretariat, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Phil. I, again, thank you very much. Can we, as this, can declassify get uh, lay hands on the donation document on how they think this crisis can be solved, and also on the crisis management document that you refer to? Is there some work uh, that declassified is doing to lay hands on this so they can better uh, shed light on the, the thinking of these people and what they are trying to do? Yeah, that's certainly something we should we should follow up on. That's that's a really good idea. Um, what we've seen since the article come out is um, at least one MP, Claudia Webb, has started to ask questions in in Parliament, um, and MPs can sometimes have um, you know the right to demand certain documents from ministers. So it would be worth seeing if if an MP in the first instance can get hold of the crisis management doctrine um or, or the dialogue plan um but if that fails there are other other routes we can try i have a feeling now that we've got this much out they might be it might be harder in future but or maybe people will start to come out now and want to um uh sort of own up to what's happening so um but no that, that those do seem like two key documents to try and get hold of next Uh, thank you. Uh, Jojo, uh, you have a question for Mr. Miller? Yeah. Yeah, question. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for, for coming to talk to us. Um, my question is, how do you think this publication can help us and how can we work with you to ensure that the world know about what is happening in, in on 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 the soil of southern Cameroons? Yeah, that, that's a good question. I think, um, you know, now this information's out there. Um, I saw this week that some people in the UK were writing to their local MPs to try and get them to raise um, a complaint with the, with the Foreign Office. Um, so I think now people are aware of what's happening. Uh, there could be calls for it to be, to be stopped or for there to be an investigation, uh, an official investigation. Um, there was a campaign recently um, about the police in Scotland had been going out to Sri Lanka for many years and training uh, Sri Lanka's security forces um, who are involved in what I would regard as a genocide against the country's Tamil minority. And that, that campaign has eventually led to um, the Scottish police pulling out and, and stopping that support. So I think once people are aware of it, you know, they can then raise it with their MPs, uh, with other media outlets as well, you know, bigger ones than, than declassified, and, and try and build up some pressure that way. Um, I think there's been, uh, in the US, I think they suspended their support or uh, reviewed their, suspended their support for the Rapid Intervention Battalion. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, you know, I've heard that your community are quite well organized in the US. And in, in America, they do have more laws. I think there's the Leahy Law or Leahy Act. There, there are certain legal mechanisms in the US that make it, um, once you can prove, prove that US mil military support is going towards a foreign unit that's involved in genocide or human rights abuses, there are certain um, uh, safeguards that you can try to activate. In the UK, unfortunately, we don't have such a developed system. Uh, there's a lot more ambiguity uh, for ministers to to continue with schemes like this and with the police with the scottish police in sri lanka that took years of, of public pressure to get that stopped um but you know the tamil community were successful in the end so i, I think you know many of the um campaigning um skills that you've used maybe in the us uh you could look at using those in, in the UK and, and seeing seeing how far you can get. But certainly the fact that the US had concerns about the Rapid Intervention Battalion, you know, that's a strong precedent to be saying, well, why then is the UK involved with them? Um, so, uh, thank you. I, I don't know. Uh, so another secretariat question, uh, if I may. Uh, I think one of the things we found quite interesting is the relationship with the DGRE which is essentially uh, Cameroon's 
call it intelligent services, right? It's external research uh, with uh, ECHO. And how close do you think uh, or do you know is the relationship uh, or the help uh, the British may be given this agency? Uh, why we ask, it, it is, of course, of particular concern because one of the things uh, Cameroon has been doing a lot is literally kidnapping Southern Cameroonians from abroad uh, and taking them to their dungeons. And I think a dungeon is literally a euphemism. If we've seen pictures, it's actually worse than uh, what uh, the Tower of London was uh, several hundred years ago. And the question is, do we know how close that relationship is? It's particularly relevant because I think British, the British uh, with their uh, permanent, uh, one of the, I'm not sure if it's a permanent secretary, uh, were, were present, had quite a big presence at the Toronto con conference that also included representatives of our fighters and individuals Cameroon would love to get their hands on and kidnap. <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I was surprised from the documents uh, how closely the UK was working with the DGRE. Um, I found that part of it quite quite chilling. Um, so that the relationship seems to be um, with uh, is it Leopold Echo Echo, uh, yeah, yeah the, <clears throat> the head of the agency. Mm -hmm. um, he seems to be uh, on good terms with Lieutenant Colonel Purser, the UK Special Forces officer who was out there. Um, and it seems to be, you know, through that personal relationship that they, they've made, they've developed this, this connection and then that's allowed them to, um, to work alongside them at places like Salak in the far North. Um, but like I was saying earlier, you know, if any intelligence, particularly with intelligence gathering techniques or skills that they teach the DGRE, even if they do the teaching in the far North, there's very little to stop them uh, applying those same techniques against um, your community. Um, but I don't, it didn't mention any activities by the agency outside of Cameroon, but um, clearly that would be a concern. Um, I think in the UK, it's more, there's more awareness about, you know, the threat from a country like Saudi Arabia trying to kidnap dissidents abroad after the Jamal Khashoggi murder. Um, but I don't think there's much um, thought gone in to that risk happening in, in the UK. I, I don't know about in, in the US. Uh, but he was, I think Leopold Echo Echo, I think he was the one that was invited to the UK. I think he's come several times as well. Um, and we also know that someone from Cameroon's intelligence uh, came to a training course, a director of intelligence training course in at a British Army base in the UK around 2018, I think it was, where MI5 and MI6 uh, give lectures. So, um, and then there's also this uh, Torchlight group, this private company that the UK Foreign Office is paying to uh give intelligence training to units including the, the dgre so um i did contact that company for comment but they they didn't respond at all um their headquarters in westminster is actually uh across the road or next door to the ministry of justice so i think they're quite a well connected company um so yes that there, there is intelligence training going on both by the UK state and by a private company like Torchlight Group? Uh, I think there's a question in the chat. Uh, Secretariat, I don't know if you want me to read it or if you want to read it. <clears throat> sure, I can read it. Yeah, go uh, ahead. It's uh, from uh, V uh, Kilo Mike. The US was able to withdraw military support to Cameroon because of the abuses against Southern Cameroons. Why did the UK not have the same reaction? So let me rephrase, I think I've misread the question. The US was able to withdraw military support to Cameroon because of abuses against Southern Cameroons. Why did the UK not have the same reaction? 
do you think there is more interest in the UK supporting BR's regime than to help resolve the Anglophone crisis? Yeah, I mean, that's something that I was surprised by because, you know, around the time that this training started, um, if the French, uh, Israel and the US had already been criticized for working with Rapid Intervention Battalion because of abuses in, in southern Cameroon and, and other places, other parts of the country. So that obviously begs the question, why did the UK effectively just ignore that and think, oh, you know, we can go in and do the same and it won't be a problem. Um, I think they didn't uh, anticipate that th this much information would come to light about it. I think they felt, you know, because they were doing it through a special forces officer, that the extent of it could could remain hidden. Um, you know, that that initial thing on Twitter we saw was just was very vague. So if we hadn't have got these documents and we wouldn't have known how much uh, deeper it, it went. Um, and I think there's a general, you know, in, in the US they do, because their legal uh, system is slightly different, there are more barriers to, to them getting away with these things. I think in the UK system, uh, the foreign office and the military um, you know, they do similar things like this in many countries where there are terrible human rights abuses going on and, and it can be very difficult to, to challenge them on it. Um, but yes, the British diplomats have clearly made, uh, a bargain that, you know, they want to, to support Paul Beer's regime, um, partly because they don't want Chinese influence growing in Cameroon. But I, I think that's, that's partly a sort of, uh, self serving justification that they use, um, you know, they're just very keen to have, um, Cameroon, I think was at, at that time, it was one of the, an, uh, an important country on, on this chemical weapons committee. So they were keen to have it voting with them. Um, but yeah, they, they've clearly, you know, thrown their, their cards in with the regime. Um, and that seems to be their priority, um, over resolving the, the situation in, in Southern Cameroon. Um, and, and, you know, give, given how well connected they are now with people like Leopold Echo Echo, they don't really have much to show for it in terms of improving the situation in, in Southern Cameroon. A few other questions, um, uh, Mr. Bella uh, from the Secretariat. Number one is the, somebody had asked about the Commonwealth relationship, you know, uh, had raised that. And the question is, how is that a relationship, how is Britain leaning on that relationship that they now have Cameroon as a member of the Commonwealth, you know, to <clears throat> do some of these things that they are doing, especially giving, and they went into that relationship because Ambazonia is the English, uh, former British colony. And in a way, are we then using, are they using Ambazonia to have gotten into a relationship that is allowing them to use that relationship, same relationship <clears throat> to kill um, Ambazonia because, you know, like somebody had actually asked, uh, talk about either ethnic cleansing or, 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 or whatever terminology that, or genocide, whatever terminology you want to use for either of those could be, uh, it's, it's really irrelevant to our situation. Yeah, I, I don't remember the, the Commonwealth being mentioned much at all in the documents. Um, I mean, it certainly didn't seem to be like a, a mechanism for like resolving the conflict in Ambazonia. Um, I mean, it, the UK seemed to be working much more bilaterally uh, with Cameroon rather than, you know, doing this as a coalition with other members of the Commonwealth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that is a very good point that, that you know, Cameroon came into the Commonwealth because of <coughs> its, the Southern Cameroon legacy. Um, and yet the UK doesn't seem to have made that a priority in its relationship with Southern Cameroon, with, with Cameroon. Um, their focus seems to be on the Boko Haram issue, but also trade, you know, they signed, I think it was a 200 million trade deal with Cameroon. Um, there's the, the Guinness factory is one of their economic interests there. Um, I, I don't think these economic interests are particularly large. Um, you know, this, this Marshall aerospace company's contract probably isn't that big, um, with the Cameroon, um, air force, but they, they seem to be prioritizing that, um, 
rather than really resolving the the anglophone crisis um, and the conflicts in Amazonia. Uh, you're touching on the on the financial aspect, like you said, the money which they've given to the government. We also know that a British company, uh, I think New Age, mm -hmm. signed a huge uh, oil and gas deal. Right. You know, in for which is which is found in southern Cameroons. Mm. Uh, we know that the British government. Uh, has made a move uh, in Gabon. The environment minister was there, and now Bongo is also pushing to join the Commonwealth. So I don't know if you know if there is a larger geopolitical move because uh, obviously Niger uh, Britain has, you know, a, a history with Nigeria. Uh, they are financing and training the BR regime. Uh, they have this oil and gas deal uh, worth billions. Uh, and then they are also moving into Gabon. So I don't know if this is a strategic um, geopolitical move by the British. Do you have any information on that? Yeah, I wasn't aware of that oil and gas deal, but that would that would make a lot of sense. Um, and like you say, in, in Nigeria, for decades, the UK policy was prioritised around companies like Shell having uh, very lucrative concessions and, and access to Nigeria's oil even when uh, people like Ken Sarawi were, were being executed. Um, so I think if there is an oil and gas deal um, off Southern Cameroons, and that, that will definitely be influencing the Foreign Office's thinking. I don't know if that was signed. So the documents I saw were from about March, April last year. So I don't know if that was before this, this deal went through. Um, yeah, that, that was before. Yeah. The, the company okay. is called a new age, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody could right. correct me. Yes. No, that you are right. And there is that, uh, it's been intensively debated in the House of um, Commons and actually even by the, uh, a, a group chaired by Lord Boateng, um, who in the British House, they've actually debated this about this deal, about the merits or the lack thereof of this deal. So there are really quite things that we can do back in there to figure, to, uh, to um, fill you in with what we know and which can allow you to... Um, you know, probably go forth and then dig more up as an investigative journalist and uh, to bring in more, more of these things to light. Yeah, that would be that would be very interesting. Um, <clears throat> just on your other point about Gabon, um, so the, the British Army was doing, um, it was giving training to Gabon's, um, they had like a anti-poaching, a kind of wildlife ranger service, um, which was run by, I think, a former British officer. Well, it was it was or a white African, but it was someone who had a lot of connections to the UK, um, and they were doing this training there for a number of years, uh, despite um, Gabon's um, regime and, and what it gets up to. Uh, they were trying to justify that again by saying it was stopping um, money from poaching going towards terrorism and drug cartels, but I, I, it seemed like a, a bit of a stretch. Um, but yes, so the UK does seem to have a growing interest in, you know, historically, obviously, Nigeria and, and the oil in, in, the, in the Niger Delta was a major uh, aspect of British foreign policy. Um, but more recently, they do seem to be kind of drifting round towards Cameroon and, and Gabon. Uh, and it's not always clear what the motive has been. So if they have found more oil, um, I'm guessing it, it's sort of offshore oil in, in that um in that kind of gulf of guinea area then uh, that could be uh, another motivation going on in the background now before we let you go uh maybe you also have some questions or some further things you may want to ask us because normally when you talk to people back home they are not very free there is the you know looming threat of uh, re reprisals or retaliation from the regime so i don't know if there's anything you had uh, before we come to Dr. Fontem, he has his hand up uh, to ask us. You're muted. You're muted, Mr. Filler, Mr. Miller. Sorry, okay. yes. Um, yes, uh, I was wondering about um, when people get, uh, you know, they, they go to the US or the UK to try and be safe and, and get asylum or sanctuary um it, it, are they finding that they are being granted asylum at the moment or 
are like the UK Home Office or, or the American equivalent? Are they trying to argue that it's safe to send people back to Cameroon? Because obviously, you know, something in the documents that is important is that the UK does acknowledge widespread human rights abuses uh, by Cameroon security forces. So I just wondered if, you know, that also the interior ministers in the, in the UK and the US, are they taking that into account or are members of your community at risk of being sent back to Cameroon at the moment? Or, yeah, that, that was something I was wondering about. Yes, I mean, uh, that is a big risk. Uh, the Trump administration actually sent a uh, three plane load full of people. Uh, it, the Biden administration was poised to continue, but literally the last plane was stopped on the runway uh, because, wow. I mean, the, 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 some Congress people really took it to heart and pushed until they stopped. But um, um, preventing deportation is not necessarily in the U.S. the same as granting asylum, right? So what we have is several thousand, I would probably say at this point, it's maybe getting close to tens of thousands of Southern Cameroonians who've made it across the Southern border who are in legal limbo. Uh, in the US, they are, they are not being deported, but they are not being granted asylum. Uh, one of the things we hope for in the US is to, to, to get what they'll call temporary protection status, TPS. Uh, we don't have as much information uh, about the UK, but I will speak broadly in Europe, uh, some places. Uh, what we really do fear though is uh, a lot of the people uh, the displaced are in Nigeria mm. and you know, several hundred thousand and quite a few of them now are making the trip up to the Mediterranean. Mm. Uh, and so there, there is a bit of a lack effect uh, but I think the search in Europe uh, 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 will come probably sooner than later as uh, the first of those start making that. Right? It takes a while, or, uh, unfortunately, uh, to make it up there. And, and that is why sometimes uh, some of the preventive humanitarian measures really, uh, if, if, if excuse uh, the figurative language, but it's literally a stitch in time. Otherwise, you know, we have this unfortunate cascading effect. Um, I don't know if anybody wants uh, to, to add to that. But um, Herman, you just add the people in Mexico, you know, who are, because there's still this. Oh, yes, yes. There, are, there are still thousands right. who are making right. the stock in Mexico who've not even crossed the border. Uh, and, and part of it is, uh, I mean, the, the situation in, in southern Cameroons is so deplorable. Uh, somebody, uh, my, uh, I think it's Mr. Harrison was talking about uh, the uh, a genocide. So there are 10 steps listed, uh, a country goes through a genocide. Uh, Cameroon has literally been through all 10 several times over, unfortunately. And, you know, for people to leave Cameroon and make it all the way to Panama and then make a trek from Panama through Mexico to the southern U.S. border, I don't, you know, somebody is not doing that because they were just afraid of a few lashes from the, the military, unfortunately. Yeah. Okay. Now that's very interesting. And yeah, I hadn't um, realized that people. Were yeah, I think uh, we, we, we have just a few more minutes. Uh, uh, Dr. Fontem, did you have a quick question? I see your hand is up. Just a quick question. We have just a few more minutes with Mr. Miller. Yeah, uh, I think... Um, we, the, I thought that the conversation had already begun and uh, I just wanted to add something to what uh, Mr. Stephen Miller uh, has just yeah, said. Yeah. Mr. Stephen Miller, I have had a first-hand experience of the, uh, the workings of the DJRL because in 2017, when I was arrested, we, uh, for information, well, uh, we started... Um, the liberation struggle in 2016. I was the Secretary General of the founding Secretary General of the consortium, which declared uh, civil disobedience. And so I was, when we were arrested, we were taken to the DJR, uh, DGR, uh, I, I have the tendency of always trying to call it in French and English, you know, I, yeah, I get mixed up at times. So the DGRE, which is the spy unit, uh, we were taken there, we arrived there at about 2.30 a.m. in the morning. We, in fact, it was an overnight trip. So um, 
what I want to say about that unit is that uh, it is responsible for much of the intelligence gathering that has been going on. And I like the way you characterize the spy chief as a dove, as a dove. If you're not careful, you will not know he's a spy chief. He's very gentle, very friendly, and his laughter is very infectious. But that's what he uses to do the work he has been called to do. Um, uh, I know him personally because I have, in the course of my arrest, is I related with him and um, how I was able to work out, it's still a story we'll tell for another day. Um, the oil deal, uh, let me just quickly chip in a few points related yes. to some of the things that we've talked about. One, the oil deal with Cameroon, uh, uh, signed by New Age, the oil deal, a ripoff. It is a ripoff, and I'd like you to, in, to investigate that in the course of your work, because seeing that Cameroon is cash strapped, New Age was able to make a cheap offer of a huge sum of money to exploit oil over a long period of time. If you calculate the amount of money and relate it to the period of time they are expected to exploit oil, which is actually Southern Cameroon's oil, you would realize that the Cameroon government was ready to give it away. First of all, one, to buy British support in this conflict. And two, to get okay. some quick money before they start to be able to pay for some of their bills and all the things that they are doing. Two, uh, the, 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 the enhancement of the capacity of the DJRO as a spy organization by the British is not only intended to strengthen Boko Haram, because the work of the DJRO addresses both Boko Haram and the Southern Cameroon's conflict. And so at no time would the British be able to say with certainty whether the elements trained in the Boko Haram fight are not the same elements being used in the Southern Cameroon's conflict. So I think that in future, it is important to make a more incisive uh, push on that particular element. Then uh, there is a yep. tendency for in term, we have very limited time. If you want to round up, there are things we can talk with Mr. Miller in the background. I'm up. <laughs> yeah, we, we can stay in touch. That, that yes. sounds very interesting. Yes. Let's yes. not. Yeah, we have limited time. Mr. Miller, limited... before you go, just sorry, one thing at all. I missed a name. If you could help, uh, as you were talking about uh, the uh, Mr. Uh, uh, DJ, uh, you mentioned the name of a British, uh, I think, uh, Intelligence chief who is, Lieutenant close, Colonel. Uh, who is close to Mr. Echo. I miss who was in Toronto. Could you please re 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 repeat the name? I missed it. Yeah, so in, in the documents, they talk about uh, Lieutenant Colonel Purser, uh, Sid Purser, um, as being the, the key British point of contact with Echo Echo. But I, I don't know if he was the same person you saw in Toronto. Um, I think that too. I think that was someone more of a diplomat, British diplomat, wasn't it? That you that was there. Oh, okay. Thanks for the clarification. Mm. But but Mr. Moderator, um, Mr. Moderator, I think that uh, the 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 people of Southern Cameroons, if the people of Southern Cameroons are not interested, some of us are very very interested. This uh, the involvement of the British. The level at which the British have gotten involved with military issues in La Republic and their involvement in the Toronto meeting with Southern Cameroonians. Are yes. we. Do Dr. What, Fontaine, we, no, we are interested no, no, it's an Mr. Open, Miller no, has no, Mr. Moderator, time. Please, I just Absolutely. want. Uh, the reason why I'm raising it is because I may forget or we may forget. Uh, it is important for us to subsequently know whether the organization of that meeting took into account the role of the British or they were not aware. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, um, uh, Mr. Miller, we know you have barely five more minutes with us. Uh, we want to use this last five minutes to uh, thank you. And hopefully um, we would stay in touch uh, with the wonderful work you're doing, not just about Cameroon, Southern Cameroons, but uh, across the continent. Uh, we need voices uh, like yours 
uh, who are on the international stage and have the attention and know how to dig and investigate these things and bring to light um, material facts that are very important to us. Uh, we are fighting in the US for the TPS, the Temporal Protective Status. Uh, we don't know the equivalent of that in the UK. Uh, if it's something you could bring up with MPs like uh, Claudia Webb and others, you know, um, Honorable Emily Thornberry, uh, those are voices that have spoken for us. Um, Lord, 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 Lord Boateng is one of the very prominent ones. Um, yes. Yeah. And yeah. We'll, we'll fill you in as we are actually in the back end, so yes. we'll get you some more additional information. And also the British media, through your fraternal uh, unions, associations, we need the British media uh, to publicize and cover our stories just like Declassified uh, does. And we are also, we also have a campaign about our political prisoners, which we launched uh, at the last town hall. Um, one of the attorneys who was here said the only thing that moves Bia is name and shame. Uh, when you embarrass dictators, then uh, they act. So we need the British media to spotlight our prisoners of conscience uh, who are just in deplorable, dehumanized uh, conditions. I know it's a plate full uh, we are asking of you, uh, but we are really stretched thin and we really don't, you know, we need every help. And we thank you. Uh, we will give you the last word before you leave us in three minutes. Yeah, well, thank you for for letting me um, meet you here today and and learn more about about what's been happening. Um, and it's it's great to have lots of ideas as well for what to investigate next. Um, and some of the things that have been happening in in the background, like that Toronto meeting, and you know, it makes you wonder what whether that was part of a wider um, agenda that, that they had there so um no it's, it's been really helpful to to speak to you all today and I, I'll, I'll try and do as much as i can to keep investigating this issue um it might not be so easy uh to get as much information next time but um you know we can always try and um and see see what more comes to light uh, especially once mps and and so on start start raising this issue as well so um yeah thank you for, for having me on your platform today thank you thank you mr miller thank you very much for coming okay thank you we'll be in touch we'll yes. stay in touch right. absolutely thank okay you. nice to meet Thanks. you